3 billion ringgit to boost ecosystems under ASEAN Investment Initiative. Johor Singapore Special Zone to boost states' economic growth. Assalamualaikum Malaysia Madani. I'm Muhammad Amin Carlos and you're watching Malaysia Tonight. An investment of up to 3 billion ringgit will be made by Sovereign Wealth Fund, Kazana National Burhad Retirement Fund Incorporated or KWAP and Blue Chip Venture Capital, BCVC. But Prime Minister Dato Sri Anwar Ibrahim said the investment will be made in Southeast Asia or SEA and Malaysian ecosystems under the ASEAN Investment Initiative. Dato Sri Anwar, who is also the finance minister, also announced that Kazana National will launch a national fund of funds with an initial 1 billion ringgit allocation to invest in innovative high growth Malaysian companies. Last October, in the Malaysia Madani Budget 2024 announcement, I outlined the government's commitment for Malaysian companies from Bumiputra entrepreneurs to startups, SMEs, and rising champions. The government is also aiming to centralize investment agencies such as MEFCAP under Punjana Capital and the Khazana. He added that the government also aims to centralize investment agencies such as Malaysia Venture Capital Management Burhad or MAVCAP and Punjana Capital under Kazana National. BCVC is a specialized fund that aims to enhance technology and value in the semiconduct industry. What? Well, Malaysia aims to attract global unicorns via the Unicorn Golden Pass so that high skilled and high value jobs are created besides developing a pipeline of future entrepreneurs and senior leaders in technology, according to Economy Minister Rafizi Ramli. Now, with the right investors and right talent in Malaysia, he said Malaysia could become the Southeast Asian base for global technology companies under the Unicorn Golden Pass. In return, we are offering a package of incentives, including exempted fees for employment passes for senior management, subsidized rental, concessionary tax rates on corporate profits, relocation services, and a startup concierge that handles the backroom registration at the start. He said in his keynote address during the KL20 summit at the Kuala Lumpur Convention Center today. Earlier in his speech, Rafizi said the goal of the KL20 action plan was to bring the top 20 startups in the world into the country through the immediate introduction of several measures. According to Rafizi, the move is aimed at accelerating the critical areas of the startup ecosystem in the country. Well, a portal that utilizes artificial intelligence or AI will be created to help people verify the information they receive, repel defamatory news and fight fraud or scams. Communications Minister Fahmi Fadil said the portal was expanded from the BR Battle special program shown on RTM. According to Fahmi, the new platform will strengthen the capabilities of existing platforms such as Subanarnia.my under the Malaysian Communications and Multimedia Commission, MCMC, and MyCheck.my managed by the Malaysian National News Agency, Bernama. Jadi, uh, saya lihat uh, kita perlu gembling uh, usaha dan uh, kemampuan biar betul sebenarnya uh, MyCheck.my dan beberapa uh, program yang lain untuk pastikan uh, memudahkan uh, rakyat yang ingin membuat pencarian tentang uh, untuk mengesahkan sebarang maklumat yang mereka uh, lihat ataupun tonton. Jadi itu yang kita kita ke arah uh, streamlining uh, semua kemampuan ini. 
He said this after launching the Jom Bacha Brasama 10-minute program at Ministry of Communications in Putrajaya today. In addition, a total of 1,878 Madani communities across the country can also be used as Bia Batal agents as the front line to fend off defamation, correct perceptions and check facts with the ministry. He said the matter was taken seriously considering that MCMC's information showed that almost 80% of the content downloaded until April was of a scam nature. Tycoon entrepreneurs have until year-end to make areas repayment. Well, the Johor State Government has vowed for the people through the Johor Singapore Special Economic Zone or JSSEZ. The Munchi Bissar, Dato On Havis Ghazi, said the JSSEZ was expected to attract foreign investments and boost the economic growth of the state, adding that the initiative will transform the landscape of Johor. We will create 100,000 quality high-paying jobs and career opportunities in various industries for each and every one of you here today. This will give you financial stability and enable you to realize your dreams. There is no he said this to students at the 9th Johor International Student Leaders Conference at a hotel in Johor Bahru today. Tata On Hafiz added that such jobs would give Johorians financial stability, enable them to realize their dreams of buying a house and a car, supporting their parents and traveling. He also told the 1,500 students and teachers present at the conference about his vision for Johor to be a developed state by 2030. Within the past two years, he said 55 strategies and 209 initiatives have been implemented. As a result, Johor has generated a total of 113.7 billion ringgit in investments and created over 35,000 job opportunities. All borrowers of the National Entrepreneurial Group Economic Fund or Tekun National have until the end of this year to make repayment of funding areas. Now, Deputy Entrepreneur Development and Cooperatives Minister Dato R. Ramanan said that the extension of the repayment period was given after taking into account that entrepreneurs who are still struggling to rebuild their businesses, which were adversely affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Memang hari-hari ada uh, tetapi of course kalau kita tengok daripada as a bulk, bulk itu saya ingat belum ada lagi lah. Kita kena bagi masa sebab orang pun sekarang tengah niaga masih lagi mereka telah uh, mengambil satu lakar untuk memulakan perniagaan balik selepas COVID. Huh? So kita bagi masa sikit lah. Is that this after attending? Well, Malaysia Tonight on TV1 ends here to give way to the Prime Minister's address at the state level Idil Fitri Madani celebration held at the Malacca International Trade Centre in Aikuro. Our bulletin resumes as usual on the Berita RTM News Channel. Well, we'll continue here with the Malaysian Qualification Agency, or MQA. Today signed a Memorandum of Understanding, or MOU, with the National Accreditation Board for Higher Education of Indonesia, or BANPT, to strengthen ties and enhance focus cooperation between the two agencies. MQA Chief Executive Officer Professor Dato Dr. Muhammad Shata Sabran said the MOU enables officers from both agencies to exchange inputs and views implement benchmarking initiatives and share procedures and responsibilities related to quality assurance more effectively.
Well, Deputy Higher Education Minister Datu Mustafa Sakmud was also present to witness the MOU signing ceremony and launch the electronic MQA accreditation system, also known as EMAS. Commenting on EMAS, Professor Datu Muhammad Shatar said the system's launch was in line with the government's digitalization agenda and MQA's strategic planning 2021-2025 through strategic thrust 3, which is effective delivery supported by resource sustainability. Well, it said the new system integrates all accreditation management modules to create an integrated platform for providing the best service delivery to higher education stakeholders. Well, Prime Minister Dato Sri Anwar Ibrahim has formed the policy advisory committee to the Prime Minister to provide counsel on matters concerning national development and economic resilience in line with the Madani economy. Now, the Prime Minister's office in a statement today announced that former Patronas President and Chief Executive Officer Tantri Mohammad Hassan Marikan will chair the committee. Well, the statement also added that members will include Dato Ahmad Fuad Mat Ali, Professor Dr. Yeh Kim Leng, and Dr. Nung Sari Ahmad Radi. The establishment of this committee follows the conclusion of the advisory committee to the Finance Minister, or ACFIN, in February 2024, which was also chaired by Tansri Mohammad Hassan Marikan. The recommendations put forth by ACFIN have been duly considered, and some are currently in the implementation process. The Prime Minister's office also clarified that the appointed committee members will not receive any remuneration from the government. Bank Negara Malaysia, or BNM's international reserves, amounted to 113.4 billion US dollars as at 15 April 2024. Now, the central bank said the reserves position is sufficient to finance 5.6 months of imports and goods and services. Well, the main components of the reserves were foreign currency reserves, which stood at 100.1 billion dollars, international monetary fund reserves amounting to 1.4 billion dollars, special drawing rights of 5.7 billion dollars gold worth 2.8 billion dollars and other reserve assets totaling 2.4 billion dollars total assets stood at 630.93 billion ringgit comprising gold foreign exchange and other reserves including special drawing rights of 536.93 billion ringgit Malaysian government papers, 12.99 billion ringgit. Well, furthermore, deposits with financial institutions stood at 1.66 billion ringgit. Loans and advances were 24.53 billion. Land and buildings were 4.12 billion ringgit and other assets amounting to 50.67 billion ringgit. Capital and liabilities comprise paid up capital worth 100 million ringgit, reserves of 192 billion ringgit, currency in circulation worth 172.25 billion ringgit, and federal government deposits of 6.09 billion ringgit. No urgent need to repatriate Malaysians in Iran, Lebanon, and Jordan. Well, there is currently no need to repatriate Malaysians who are in Iran, Jordan and Lebanon at the moment. And Foreign Minister Dato Sri Mohammad Hassan said Wisma Putra is constantly monitoring developments in the volatile region and is in close contact with the National Security Council should the need arise for any immediate action. Many people ask about Malaysia Malaysia in Iran di Jordan, di Lebanon kan. Di Iran tak ramai, cuma 38 orang sahaja termasuk staff embassy kita. Tak ada apa-apa. Di Jordan tu ramai, kebanyakannya pelajar-pelajar. Ada 2,000 lebih orang, hampir 3,000 orang. Tak ada apa-apa masalah di sana. 
He added that in Lebanon there are about 800 Malaysians, of which the majority of them are peacekeeper soldiers serving with the United Nations Interim Force in Lebanon, known as UNIFIL. Datu Sri Mohammed said this after met by reporters in the Foreign Ministry Idol Fitri celebration ceremony in Putrajaya. Commenting on the conflict in the region, he expressed hope for de-escalation, stating that the ongoing conflict between the two countries brings no benefit to the world. Well, closer to home, Indonesian authorities on Monday lowered the alert level of a remote volcano that erupted more than half a dozen times in the last week while the nearest international airport reopened after being shuttered for days. While officials had warned the threat from the Mount Ruang Strato volcano in Indonesia's outermost region was far from over after it sparked the evacuation of thousands when it stirred a specular mix of lava ash columns and lightning last week. Now, volcanic activity has since calmed at the crater and the country's volcanology agency lowered the alert level to the second highest of a four-tiered system on Monday. Sam Ratulangi International Airport in the provincial capital of Manado, more than 100 kilometers from the crater, reopened on Monday afternoon, according to authorities. Well, it came after days of closures at the airport where some airlines fly to Singapore, South Korea and China because of volcanic ash. Now, more than 6,000 residents of neighboring Tagulandang Island, home to around 20,000 people, were evacuated outside the exclusion zone since the eruptions began, but no injuries or deaths were reported. Indonesia, a vast archipelago nation, experiences frequent seismic and volcanic activity due to its position on the Pacific Ring of Fire. A chemical waste warehouse in Rayong caught fire, sending thick columns of black smoke into the sky on Monday morning. Well, police said the warehouse located in Bankai district had caught fire at 9 a.m. as firefighters struggled to control the blaze. Now, locals said they have been hearing sporadic explosions since the fire broke out. At around 10.45 a.m., firefighters were only able to contain the blaze but could not put out even though 40 firemen and 11 fire trucks, seven shooting foam, were at work. At 12.45 p.m., the fire was under control, although it continued to burn, according to the Ryong Office of the Public Relations Department. Despite the chemical smell in the air, which was detectable up to four kilometers north of the company, pollution control officials confirmed that the air quality in the area remained safe. The fire originated in a warehouse where around 20,000 liters of solvents were stored in barrels. From there, the flames spread to the industrial waste warehouse. Notably, the area houses about 30 ponds of contaminated oil. Coming up in sports, 12 countries to appear in Kuching for World Boxing Championship 2024. Well, 12 countries have officially confirmed their participation in the World Boxing Championship or WBC 2024 in Kuching. This according to the Sarawak Public Communications Unit. So this marks the first time the event will be hosted in Malaysia, scheduled for 11 May at Petra Jaya Indoor Stadium. Sarawak Amateur Boxing Association President Dato Rahman Lariwu said the participating countries will include Japan, Kazakhstan, the UK, Australia, Myanmar, India, Thailand, France, the Philippines, Singapore, Brazil and host Malaysia. Kita menyeru kepada peminat-peminat sukan combat tinju untuk datang beramai-ramai pada 6 hari bulan Mei sehingga 11 hari bulan Mei di mana kejohanan profesional julung kali kita adakan di Bandar Kuching. Speaking to RTM in Kuching, he also highlighted that local talent Dailonial Magdalon Bong, also known as Kilat Boy, will represent Malaysia competing in the Super Bantamweight 55.3 kilogram category. 
Furthermore, the Sarawak Open Championship 2024 is set to take place from 6 to 10 May at the same venue with expectations of intense competition as participants will include boxers from Peninsula Malaysia, Sabah, Sarawak, West Kalimantan, Sumatra, Singapore and Sri Lanka. And on to the world's most beautiful games is Pele. Well, Manchester United survived one of the most astonishing FA Cup semi-final comebacks ever to beat second-tier Coventry City 4-2 on penalties after a chaotic clash and a 3-all following extra time at Wembley Stadium on Sunday. Well, United were cruising to a record 22nd FA Cup final and a repeat clash with Manchester City thanks to goals by Scott McTominay, Harry Maguire and Bruno Fernandes with Coventry barely laying a glove on their opponents for 70 minutes. But Coventry were not about to go down without a fight. Goals by Ellis Sims and Callum O'Hare gave them hope and with United rocking, Haji Wright stroke home a stoppage time penalty after an Aaron one Bisaka handball. The both sides hit the woodwork in a nerve-shredding extra 30 minutes. And after a scoreless extra time, Casimiro missed the opening spot kick for United in a shootout, but Onana saved O'Hare's kick. Ben Chiv fired his effort over the crossbar to leave Rasmus Hodgelin with the job of sending United through as he sent his effort past Coventry keeper Bradley Collins. United celebrated, but they know they came within a whisker of calamity and it was a performance that will heap further scrutiny on manager Eric Ten Hag. In the Premier League, Liverpool climbed level on points with Arsenal at the top of the table with a 3-1 victory over Fulham at Craven Cottage on Sunday thanks to goals from Trent Alexander-Arnold, Ryan Gravenberch and Diogo Jota. Now, Liverpool trail Arsenal on goal difference with both on 74 points with five games remaining. However, holders Manchester City, who are third on 73 points, have a game in hand. Now, a week after Crystal Palace dealt Liverpool's title hopes a crushing blow with a 1-0 defeat, Sunday's victory infused Jurgen Klopp's men with renewed hope. Alexander-Arnold curled a stunning free kick into the top corner in the 32nd minute that keeper Bernd Leno had little chance of stopping. Timothy Castan, however, drew Fulham level when he fired home just before the break with a side for the shot pass keeper Alisson. Graven Birch, a summer signing, put the Reds back on top in the 53rd minute when Harvey Elliott pounced on a loose Fulham pass across the centre of the pitch. He rolled it to Graven Birch, who curled a shot inside the far post for his first league goal. Jota sealed the win in the 72nd minute with his 100th English club career goal across all competitions with a low strike inside the far post after a pass from Cody Gakpo. In La Liga, Real Madrid's pursuit of a record-extending 36th title gathered momentum after Jude Bellingham scored a goal in added time to secure a 3-2 comeback win over Barcelona. Real twice fought back from a goal down before Bellingham smashed in the winner at the far post from about six yards out to beat the champions for a fourth successive time. Well, Barca took the lead in the sixth minute when Andreas Christensen headed in following a corner after Real goalkeeper Andre Lunin failed to clear the cross from his six-yard box. Vinicius Jr. equalized 12 minutes later from the penalty spot after Lucas Vasquez was fouled inside the box. Wasteful Real dominated the second half but missed several chances and allowed substitute Fermin Lopez to give the visitors the lead again in the 69th minute from a rebound. Real, however, hit back with a Lucas Vasquez volley four minutes later. Real kept pushing for another goal and their perseverance paid off in added time when Vasquez raced down the right channel and crossed to Bellingham who fired in the winner. The result left second place Barca 11 points adrift of the leaders with six games left.
In tennis, world number six, Casper Ruud, defeated Stefano Sipsipas 7-5-6-3 to win the Barcelona Open on Sunday. And that is the biggest title of his career. Now, the Norwegian earned revenge after his defeat by the Greek world number seven in the Monte Carlo Masters final last weekend. Well, Rudd's 91-minute victory ended a 10-match winning streak for Sipsipas. The sixth seed conceded a break in the opening game, with Sipsipas consolidated for two love, giving the chance of a repeat of his first set collapse in the Monte Carlo final. However, Rudd stayed calm and broke back in the sixth game with a passing shot the Greek could not control. The Norwegian brought up two set points at 6-5 up, clenching it with a break when Tsitsipas eared in the net. Rudd, a three-time Grand Slam winner, had won 10 titles at 250 level with 500-ranked clay court event in Barcelona, his 11th career triumph. Elsewhere, Kazakh's fourth seed Elena Rybakina defeated Ukrainian Marta Koistyuk in straight sets to win the WTA event in Stuttgart. 2022 Wimbledon champion Rybakina beat Koistyuk 6-2, 6-2 in one hour, nine minutes, ending the 21-year-old Ukrainian's giant killing run at the tournament. The world number four broke Koistyuk twice in the first set and twice in the second, fighting off three break points from the world number 27 to lift her eighth career title. Ribakina now holds a two to one record against Koistyuk. The title is her third of 2024, having already won in Brisbane and Abu Dhabi, and it is the first time she has won three WTA titles in one year. Sunday's victory was also the 24-year-old's third title win on clay in her career. Well, that's it from us this evening. In our top story, three billion ringgit to boost ecosystems under ASEAN Investment Initiative. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Thanks for watching. Good night.